Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I f***ed your granddaughter. All right. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Charlie Brooker, and you're watching Screenwiper, a programme all about television. You know, a lot's happened since we were last on air. Jesus Hussein Christ was elected leader of the free world, the economy disappeared, more on that later, and perhaps most significantly of all, the Whisper Bar was relaunched. But none of these events really captured the public's imagination like one other thing, one very stupid thing. I'd like to apologize for these terrible yeah, attacks, Andrew Sachs. I'd like to show contrition bom, bom. to the max, bom, bom. Andrew Sachs. Bom, 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 bom. Yes, Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand made a deeply misjudged prank phone call to National Treasure Manuel Sachs, which was so hilarious, thousands of people were confused by its sheer brilliance and reacted by getting angry instead. The resulting row had everything. Outrage, swearing, a satanic slut, and a long-haired Dickensian dicking machine. It also highlighted a yawning generation gap that threatened to tear the nation asunder. Spunky Five News went to a place where they know what's funny to prove old people hated it. After all, this town was the setting for the TV show Last of the Summer wine. That won't say it disgusts me, really. I think they should be sat. Whereas irritating young people couldn't see any problem with it at all. They both apologised. They said that there's a poultry apology, but they're comedians. They kind of don't apologise properly anyway. For several surreal days, the story was draped all over the news like a silly tarpaulin. Even when Manuel himself tried to calm things down, it continued to shunt lesser stories down the agenda. He accepts the men's apologies and does not wish to take the matter any further. I'm not going to take it anywhere. I'm not out for revenge or anything like that. Also tonight, tens of thousands of refugees on the move across eastern Congo. Yeah, whatever. This was a perfect storm which largely rolled out of control because the BBC was too slow to act. Well, come on, it did happen in half-term week after all. It left a vacuum in which the papers had a field day. But why did they bother? Well, apart from hating Jonathan Ross and the licence fee and young people like Russell Brand, there's another reason. <laughs> Newspapers are a dying format. What with the internet and 24-hour news channels, no one really reads them for news anymore. That's why there's more emphasis on opinion, celebrity gossip and, crucially, campaigns. And a campaign against television is the gift that keeps on giving. I work in both papers and TV, so I feel I can say with some authority that the papers are full of it. They fill their pages with shit and garbage on a daily basis, padding out their sad, obsolete little platforms with scaremongering bigotry or life-wrecking scandal stories or fusty preaching or intrusive photographs of some pop starlet lurching out of a nightclub at 2am with her tit hanging out of her blouse taken by some fat-ass paparazzi scumbag you wouldn't even want to shake hands with in case his peeping Tom Shitter he was somehow catching. They actually pay these massive arse and then they've got the temerity to turn round and have a pop at TV the minute anything vaguely untoward appears on screen. Well, f*** them. Having tasted blood, some corners of the press became hungry for more. Suddenly everything of questionable taste was fair game as they cried foul over almost every other youth-skewed comedy show on television. Things reached a surreal nadir when Director General Mark Thompson had to go on Newsnight and listen to Emily make this recounting lines from Mock the Week. I'm now so old, my pussy is haunted. In days of yore, viewers who were offended by something used to call the station and leave messages which were duly entered into the duty log for producers to laugh about the next day. <laughs> or they joined Mary Whitehouse's Clean Up TV campaign, in which case everyone laughed at them. But viewers today have grown accustomed to influencing TV directly thanks to exciting models of democracy like The X Factor, giving them the right to choose between a paunchy howling cabaret dad and a peeled Jamie Oliver fetus. As a result, thousands of joyless crybabies have learned to treat the whole of TV as a reality show in which they can vote off the things they don't like by complaining to Ofcom whether they saw the offending broadcast or not. Before long, they're going to want special complaint buttons on their remotes. Wah! Wah! I saw something bad on the telly! Wah! I didn't even actually see it, but I read about it and it looked bad, so wah! That's why even a harmless joke from Jeremy Clarkson about the merciless slaughter of sex workers can provoke a media storm. Change gear, change gear, change gear, check your mirrors, murder a prostitute, change gear, change gear, murder. Check your... That's a lot of effort in a day. The trouble with all this is that if we're not careful, TV, and the BBC in particular, might overreact in a bid to placate the mooing mob, and one misjudged phone call could end up being used as a stick to beat all TV comedy with. 
the Beebs promising to take a look at the way edgy shows are vetted prior to transmission, and that might affect all comedy output, including this show. But there's nothing new about tasteless shock humour, as a trip to 1970 will verify. Monty Python delighted in pushing the boundaries, even mocking audience outrage at their own show in this gloriously tasteless sketch in which John Cleese visits an undertaker to arrange his mother's funeral. Well, there are three things we can do with your mother. We can burn her, bury her or dump her. Dump her? <laughs> dump her in the Thames. What? Where is she? Oh, she's in the set. Come on! She looks quite young. Yes, yes, she was. Fred! Yeah, I think we've got an eater. No. What? Oh, the oven on. Right. Are you suggesting eating my mother? <laughs> yeah, not raw, cooked. I really don't think I should. Look, tell you what, we'll eat her. If you feel a bit guilty about it afterwards, we can dig a grave and you can throw up in it. <laughs> See, absolutely horrible, and that was 38 years ago. If the broadcaster had been prissy, we'd never have seen Python, just like we'd never have seen any of the following. The grimy humour of Steptoe and Son. B-U-M Bum. I'm just like that bald. It's disgusting. <laughs> the groundbreaking satire of Not the Nine O'Clock News. Savage, why do you keep arresting us? He's a villain, sir. A villain. And, and a jailbird, sir. I know he's a jailbird, Savage. He's down in the cells now. We're holding him on a charge of possession of curly black hair and thick lips. <laughs> <laughs> the anarchic silliness of the young ones shot at a time when the mere sight of a tampon was shocking. It's a telescope! <laughs> Near the knuckle sketches in the day to day. Oh, she like a metal dick in my head. Magazine like a big testicle gland. You gotta kill people to have respect for people. Or the potty mouth political humor of the thick of it. I will remove your iPod from its tiny nano sheath and push it up your cock. And then, and then, then I'll, I'll plug some speakers up your ass and put it on a on shuffle with my fucking fist. Start censoring or even self-censoring and you can wave goodbye to all of that. Yes, there's a lot of lame shock humour around, but that's the price you pay for freedom of speech and, in my view, it's a price worth paying. So next time a raging crowd starts complaining retrospectively to Ofcom, how about establishing some kind of counter-complaint system by which those who aren't offended can cancel out each complaint with a counter-complaint of their own? Who knows, we might sail somewhere close to sanity, together, as a people in metaphorical boats. That's the end of this bit. How is another bit? You know, it's reassuring that in this morally bankrupt age of sweary shock TV, there are still corners of the schedule where you can find wide-eyed sweetness and wholesome charm and music and dancing and infuriating little piss weasels. Britannia High is ITV1's stunningly similar take on the high school musical formula, set in a version of London Twin with America. The show charts the fortunes of a gaggle of all singing, all dancing irritant pipsqueaks as they perfect the art of Tupperware showbiz at school for the performing arts, unconvincingly overseen by the bank manager from the Nationwide ads. Don't be a wannabe. Be who you want to be. Yes, although it helps if what you want to be is a wannabe tip, because Britannia High isn't so much a school for the performing arts as an absolute hive full of grating show-offs which in any sane world would have its windows bricked up by the government before the self-satisfied inmates could get out and infect the rest of the population. It's like a spawning point for enemies in a video game. The sort of place you'd be happy to circle with frag grenades for about six hours sending limbs flying through the air finishing off the survivors with a railgun blast to the temple. As you may have noticed, the kids of Britannia High have been programmed to burst into song at the drop of a hat, blasting out saccharine tunes about how delighted they are to be alive at our expense. All coming over all self-pitying and staring up their own bums, musically speaking. The main characters, or targets as I like to think of them, are the squeakiest clean of the lot. There's Jez. My name's Jez.